and I'm gonna, I guess, assume that all of you have access to the GitHub. But yeah, like I said, send me a message if you did not. Let Holger know if you don't. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm going to start sharing my screen. Um, and I'm going to do screen two. Share and move that off to one side. Okay, um, apparently a bunch of people suggested that we talk about nonlinear mixed effects models as will become obvious as we go through. I know something about them. I do not know everything about them. And in particular, there are a couple of instances where um, looking at at least some of the documentation, but not all of it, I haven't been able to figure out how to do some things. These are definitely uh, very powerful, very finicky um, models, as we'll see as we go through. So what I'm going to do, uh, my slides are basically an introduction to the problem, and then I have code that goes through one example posted on the web page. There are two examples actually in this. The second example with data and a problem that comes from Gina is vastly more complicated than the first one, and I'm guessing if there's interest, that's going to have to be um, two weeks from now uh, in order to talk about all the bells and whistles that are necessary to deal with that more complicated example. So, um, hang on a second here. Um, what we're talking about, and I'll, I'll jump actually ahead, um, a bunch, I should have put this at the beginning. What we're talking about are problems like this. This is the example I will talk about today. Um, this comes from data, it's, it's a paper that Fernando was on, and I should acknowledge right up front, um, Fernando's been an excellent resource. Um, he knows things that I don't um, about fitting some of these models. And so some of the things in here, he's been able to help me out immensely, for which I'm very thankful. So here are data. Uh, this is data from three plots, numbered one, two, and three, uh, where we have some measurements. This is the moisture content in fuel in an um, Argentine uh, grassland, if I remember correctly, uh, grassland shrubland. And each one of these curves might be fit with a, some sort of nonlinear model, something that's probably logistic sort of shaped, flat at the beginning, drops, and then flat at the end. If we had just one plot, we would talk about these data in using nonlinear, uh, sorry, um, yeah, nonlinear regression the stuff that Fernando talked about for the last two weeks. But in this case, we have data from three plots. And how do we incorporate the potential variability between these three plots? That's what a nonlinear mixed effect model is going to try to do. So with that as context, um, what they combine are ideas from nonlinear models and linear mixed effects models. We'll see how that's done in a few minutes. They're incredibly powerful because they're incredibly flexible. They can be very difficult, both from the statistical theory and also the practical. Software is getting better and better and better, but there are still some big holes. And I'll talk more about some of the, the sort of, oh, I wish they were doing things differently um, in software as we go through. So what I'm going to talk about to set the stage are linear mixed effects models, a quick reminder of some of the salient features, which will explain why nonlinear models are surprisingly harder, or are not surprisingly, but are much harder. A quick review of nonlinear models, emphasizing something that I'm gonna focus on later um, that Fernando didn't emphasize, and then put the two together in nonlinear mixed effects models. And then talk about two alternative ways of approaching exactly the same data, one using meta-analysis and one going fully Bayes. As you'll gather as we go through here, there is no single way of uh, fitting data like I just talked about. Um, we can approach it in different ways. They have different strengths. I'll share some of my sense of what strengths are, pluses and minuses. So that's what we're going to do. Start with a quick review of a couple of things and then go on um, to talk about nonlinear mixed effects models. So a linear mixed effects model is an analysis of variance or a regression where there are multiple sources of variability. There are extra random effects. 
And those random effects are often used to describe clusters of data. So essentially describing correlations between observations. Just to reinforce some of those ideas, I'm going to look at a data set that I looked at a few years ago, which are numbers of sea turtles nesting on seven beaches over time. The each beach is observed for multiple years. The cluster is the beach. And what we want to do is to estimate trend over time and then ask where the trend is consistent on all the beaches. So there are the data. Uh, the y-axis is a log scale. Uh, these uh, straight line, at least visually, looks like a usual approximation. The seven different colored lines represent seven different beaches. So let's build the model bit by bit. We'll start with the linear regression, which is the log count, the y, is just simply a linear function of time, the x, plus some additive error, because we're going to use uh, ordinary least squares to fit this. Clearly, fitting one line to all seven data points misses an important part of the variability between these lines. So let's allow the intercept to vary by beach. So I've added a subscript there. This is just another uh, fixed effects model. And if I wanted to make conclusions not about each of these seven individual beaches, but treat these beaches as if they were from a population of beaches, and that a eighth beach might have something similar to these seven, but not exactly the same as any one of those seven, then I can accommodate that in the model by making inter the intercept a random effect. And I'm writing it this way, as you'll see in a second. I have a fixed effect, the same beta from that's common to all beaches, but each beach is allowed to deviate, not totally willy-nilly like in the first model, but with a distribution on those U's, those deviations for each beach from the overall average. And that can be written in two different ways. It can be written this way, where I have a separate fixed effect and a random effect, or I can just simply have a random effect, which is centered at mean beta naught rather than mean of zero. These two models are identical. That's putting one random effect into the model. It is still assuming that X is the same for all beaches. So let's add a slope. Let's make the slopes also a random effect, centered at the slope. And written this way, I have these two random effects assumed to be independent of each other. And the final bells and whistles model up makes the intercept and slope correlated so that the pair of intercept and slope for each beach follows a multi bivariate normal distribution, the mean centered in the same place, but the random effects have a variance for each effect and also a non-zero covariance. These same ideas that one can model all random effects independent, all random effects correlated, only one random effect, other things are fixed, are ideas that carry straight across into nonlinear mixed effect models. So the way a statistician writes a nonlinear mixed effects model is usually this way. Y is some fixed effect things, X beta, which are the beta naught and beta one intercept and time. And then a design matrix for the random effects called Z times a vector of random effects. So this Z would capture each individual beach. And so then it's easy, and then there's a, if I'm, again, working in a normal world, um, additive normally distributed errors, this can be relaxed. I'm not going to go there today. It's easy to write down what's called the conditional distribution. If you tell me the random effect for this beach, I can write down the distribution of Y given that random effect. The random effect gets pulled into the mean, and all I'm left with is an independent sigma squared error. Notice the problem. I started by saying, if you tell me what the random effect is, but I don't know what that is. This specification, which is easy to write down and easy to fit, is the conditional distribution of Y given U. In order to construct a likelihood, and all of these analyses are going to be maximum likelihood analyses rather than these squares analyses, I need the marginal distribution of Y, not Y given U, but why? And in general, to get from a conditional distribution to a marginal distribution, you integrate. 
So the conditional, the marginal distribution of y is the conditional distribution times the distribution of the random effects integrated over the random effects. Nasty word, integrate. When the random effects and the errors are normally distributed, a, a small part of statistical magic happens. That integral does not have to be done explicitly. It can be done analytically, it's been done for years, and that marginal distribution of y is a normal distribution centered at the fixed effects with a variance-covariance matrix that depends on properties of the U's and the design matrix and properties of the errors. So this difficult problem with an integral becomes a simple problem with a basically very big multivariate normal distribution. And because of this ZGZ transpose term, the random effects that we have modeled explicitly result in the observations that we see having non-zero covariances, so they're correlated. If you like names, when you only have an intercept, this variance has a structure called compound symmetric. When you have both an intercept and the slope as random effects, the variance is more complicated. The result, however, is a multivariate normal distribution, and that is easy, in quotes, to fit usually done iteratively. You assume some fixed effects parameters, use a well-behaved algorithm to estimate the random effects parameters, figure out what the variance of y is given those parameters, use generalized least squares to go back and estimate the fixed parameters, chase your tail a few times around, and unless you've got a really complicated model, you end up converging to solutions very easily. What makes this all fly is the fact that we have a large multivariate normal distribution for the marginal distribution of y. So that's linear mixed effects models. What are nonlinear models without fixed, uh, mixed effects? Um, we relax the assumption of linearity. We have just this arbitrary function that connects the x's, parameters, and we might write that as um, plus an additive error, and that gets us into nonlinear least squares. One could write the model I used for sea turtles which was linear in log y as an exponential model, y naught is e to the rx plus an error. And that has exactly the same fixed model, this version I used before, which was the log linear version, and this nonlinear version, which is y um, times e to the um, some parameter. Those are mathematically exactly the same if you're a mathematician, not a statistician. In other words, if you ignore the plus epsilon, the errors, the variability. Why is this a nonlinear equation? Because the parameter R enters not as an additive const number times some constant or something known, not a, long, not a linear function. The difference between these two to a statistician is they make different assumptions about the errors, about constancy of errors. They're different on different scales log or raw, and the assumed distribution are on different scales. So statistically, these two models can be quite different, and it's because of what they assume about the errors. The point I wanted to make about nonlinear models to emphasize um, something that I find is one of the really big advantages of a nonlinear model is that you can rewrite models using more interpretable parameters. So one way of writing a quadratic response model is to write it as a linear function, where I have a linear term and a quadratic term. Sometimes these linear and quadratic terms can be hard to interpret. An alternate version, same model, same fixed effects, are to write it as a curvature B2 times the difference between the x value and the maximum or the minimum, the location of the maximum and minimum. This form is now nonlinear in the parameters so you have to use nonlinear least squares as opposed to least squares to estimate it. But what you get out is a more interpretable estimate of the of a parameter that is more interpretable in terms of your biological circumstance. Yes, you can compute XM from these two terms here, but then you've got to know how to do that. If you fit this as a nonlinear regression, it's very easy to do inference on XM and differences between XM between different groups, for example. Second example, same problem, same idea. 
a two parameter logistic curve. So this starts at zero, goes up to one logistically, can either be written as a linear function of beta naught plus beta one, or we can reparameterize it in terms of a slope term and what in toxicology at least is called the LC50. It's the X at which the response is at. In toxicology, it's the length of concentration that kills 50% of, of your critters. Notice here that we, here it's very clear that we can estimate beta naught because beta naught is exactly the same as beta one times the LC50. All we've done is change the way we're describing the problem from one nonlinear form to another nonlinear form. So let's put those ideas together. Nonlinear mixed effects models. We have clusters of observations that can arise from a variety of different ways. If we fit one nonlinear model to all three of those plots, we're probably violating the assumption of independent errors. If I was interested in each cluster separately, each one of those plots, I could fit separate nonlinear models. Or I can combine the, uh, these two ideas, start with a nonlinear model, and put a random distribution on some or all of the parameters. Like with the, the sea turtles and beaches, if I do that, then I can make inference to new clusters in the population, which I can't do if I fit each one separate. So, really easy to write down the model, and it's really hard to, to fit it to data or to estimate the parameters. I say that before software made it sort of easy, but even so, it can still be problem, problematic. So why is nonlinear mixed effect modeling so hard, so much harder? The conditional distribution is real easy. It's just a nonlinear function applied to things that depend on both the betas and the random effects. But remember, like with the linear mixed effects model, I don't want this conditional distribution. I need the marginal distribution which means I need to integrate out those random effects. And the things that make it possible to get that large multivariate normal distribution no longer hold true. That integral here is almost never an analytic solution. There is no nice multivariate normal distribution for Y unless you have a really, really, really special nonlinear model. So that was the way things worked until late 1970s, 1980s, when people began to come up with computational approaches that could actually fit these sorts of models. They go, the, the approaches that have been taken are to take our nonlinear model and linearize it. Mathematically, that's called a Taylor approximation. Um, these are known as pseudo likelihood methods, and they basically turn the model into a linear model, and then we can treat it as a linear mixed effects model. A completely different mathematical computational approach is to leave the nonlinear model as is and approximate the integral. Remember, that's the difficult part. And these go by the name of a Laplace approximation or Gaussian quadrature or adaptive Gaussian quadrature. Completely different computational solution. Or we go Bayesian, add a prior distribution on all the parameters, use a Markov chain Monte Carlo algorithm to simulate samples from the posterior distribution of the parameters. So this is avoiding doing that integral by writing a Markov chain that generates samples from that, from the integrated marginal distribution. My understanding is that two of the major software packages take different approaches. The NLME package, which is the extension of the LME, um, is the function in the same package that has the LME function linearizes the model, whereas the alternative, the, the package, the function that's in the LME4 package uses a Laplace approximation. A fourth idea, a fourth computational approach completely different from any of these first three, focuses on the experimental unit. If I was treating plots in, in the example that I'll come back to in a couple of minutes, um, the plot might be the unit of randomization, and it's observed over time, and I want to look at how the curve responds over time. So a, an experimental unit-based approach would be to fit a nonlinear model to each experimental unit, extract the estimate and its precision, and then use meta-analysis to estimate the overall estimate and the precision of that overall estimate, and also estimate the heterogeneity amongst the experimental units. Meta-analysis is usually the term used when you're trying to estimate an overall mean, Meta regression is when you're trying to estimate a higher level model 
that relates effects on each individual experimental unit. And I'll talk more about meta-analysis in just a few minutes. Four different, three different approaches, um, one with two different ways of computationally doing something. All of them provide estimates, standard errors, and inferences for the fixed effects. All of them provide estimates of variability. All of them allow you to do predictions with standard errors for a subject that's in the data set. I know this interpolation. The frequentist mixed effects, the NLME and the, LM, and the L, NLEMR, can predict for new subjects. They can also um, do what I call partial pooling, which we'll see an example of later. Um, but they do inference based on normal approximations. What do I mean by partial pooling? Because this is the difference between the meta-analysis view and the mixed effects view. Let's consider the quadratic response model. We have three parameters, an intercept, a curvature, and a maximum. Let's assume that, in fact, all groups have the same curvature, but they differ in the other two parameters. The model would then have random effects for the two parameters where the clusters differ, but not for beta 2. That's what I mean by partial pooling. That's easily done in a frequentist mixed effects model. Um, this is a quick summary of the differences between the two major packages. Um, the big gotcha, and Fernando gave me some very useful, he had more up to date on what's going on here. Um, Neither of these is in active development. The LME4 version is being maintained by Ben Bolker, who's a quantitative ecologist, but there's not much active development going on. Uh, that's not good. Both are being maintained. Um, I don't know who's maintaining NLME right now, uh, but when I looked on the page, there were updates as recently as November 2019, and Ben Bolker is maintaining the, uh, the NLEMR package. But they have different characteristics, and some things are easy in one and harder in another. Bayesian um, mixed effects models, you can easily make predictions for old or new subjects. You can easily control pooling of the information. And most importantly, inference can be based directly on the posterior distribution. You don't need to make an assumption of normality. Don't get that for free. You have to specify prior distributions, which requires thought. Um, the package I'm going to demonstrate requires less thought because the priors are thought to be reasonable. And all sorts of Bayesian work has all sorts of traps for the unaware, unaware and that's especially so for nonlinear models. From the vignette on one of the big packages, um, basically, they're incredibly powerful and they require an awful lot of care, both with specifying the model and specifying the priors. Um, and generalized linear models are harder than linear models. Last comparison, meta-analysis. It's probably the easiest to fit a complicated fixed effect model using meta-analysis, but the downside is you cannot partially pool information. And that's because a meta-analysis starts with a separate fit to each group. It ignores a group when the model and it ignores a group when the model doesn't fit. Easy to do computationally, appropriate for some questions, but not appropriate for all questions. So the example I'm going to spend my time talking about the rest of today is leaf fire, fire moisture content. The data is in Fernando's NLRAA package, it's the LFMC data. Fernando has a paper in College and Evolution. There's the DOI for it. The big data set has four species, each measured multiple times, two sites, each with, um, sorry, that should be each with three plots. So a total of six plots total. And destructively sampled individuals, each plot each time. Code is in the supplemental material. I'm going to keep things simple. Look at one species that's only in one site, three plots, and I'm going to ask the same two questions. Which parameters appear to vary among plots? What's the typical curve? And I'm going to illustrate my code um, in LME.R that's on the GitHub site, 
and the PDF that's produced by Markdown, this Markdown document has additional comments um, about the code as well as copies of the code. I'm going to work from the code because there are certain things that generate errors, which of course muck up a Markdown um, knitter, uh, but I can do them on my, uh, interactively without any problem. I'm going to demonstrate using NLME and Lemmer, the Bayesian version using Stan and El Elmer. Um, make a comment that Fernando prefers a different Bayesian package, which requires a little bit more thinking, but that's quite likely a good thing here. And then using the metaphor package to do meta-analysis. So those are the data we looked at before. Um, no treatments, three plots, and I'm interested in describing um, what's the typical curve and what's the variability between the plots. As a teaser, um, and this, if it's interest, will be something we, can, we will not be able to talk about today, and we can talk about it in weeks. Um, Gina has a much more complicated uh, example. This is nitrogen leaching as a function of fertilizer applied. Nine sites, each with 20 years, each with two crop rotations, um, with a variety of different goals. And just to show you the sort of data that we have, this is just for 2010. There are 20 years. This is the two rotations in the two rows, corn, soy, and continuous corn, and the seven different sites. And what we wanted to try to do is to summarize the variability, fit models to these, describe the variability, um, describe how things vary, and look at the difference between the two rotations across the different times. So lots of complicated questions, and if there's interest, we'll do this in two weeks. All right. Pause for any questions. I'm not sure what the best way to do that is. Unmute yourself, probably. Any questions okay. from anyone? Okay. Go ahead. I don't know, it's just me. I was just making sure everyone could unmute themselves if they have any questions. I think they can. Yeah, I was actually just typing this into the chat, but I'm going to just say it because I'm unmuted. I'm just wondering if you could say um, a little bit more about what a meta-analysis is. Let me do that by example. Perfect. <laughs> That'll be the easiest way. Okay. Because um, that's a, another hour, 50 minute, whatever topic of its own right. Um, so um, let me fire up my libraries. This is working through the code. Um, so, as I said, I've already done most of this. Yes. Um, so, to show you how to use NLME functions first, um, and I've made the text big, um, hopefully that's visible to everybody. Um, what we're going to start with is fitting a fixed effect model this um, four parameter logistic to each plot separately. Remember, these, these are the leaf fire data. There are three different plots, follow, each followed through time. So in the L this is in the NLME library. The first thing to do is to define the groups in the data. And so that's what the grouped data function does. The y, we have a formula which specifies the Y variable and the x variable that, that goes into the nonlinear regression, in this case it's time, vertical bar plot. So much like the Elmer syntax for specifying a random effect, vertical bar, the plot, given the plot, and then where to find the data. Once you do that, there is a really nice lattice graph plot, which is what you see, what I put into the notes. Basically, the dots are connecting the means for each time. And you don't have to do much, you just get it automatically. If we want to fit each curve separately, or each plot to a separate curve, the NLS capital L list function takes care of that. We have to name the y variable again. We have to name a function, we can put an equation, but it's easiest if you use what's called a self-start function that I'll talk about in just a second. A predefined function 
This is the decreasing logistic function. And the arguments there, these are all function specific. They are the X variable, which is time, and then the names I want to use for the four parameters. The upper, the, the, the value here at the top, the value at the bottom, the value on the x-axis, which is halfway in between, and the scale, which is basically how quickly it drops. Does it drop slowly through the middle, or does it drop like a cliff? The number of parameters depends on the function you're fitting. These names are my names. They will be what gets used in the output. This is the variable in the data set that gives us um, the x value, and we pass it the grouped data. So that works really quickly. And if I plot it, oops, that's not plotting it. Um, I, the plots the, um, name it's because it's done separately for each plot. Um, that's right, it gives me something else. So um, I get, if I print it out, I get the coefficients for each one of the three vari four vari four parameters fit to data from each one of the plots. This fitting assumes a single residual standard error, same residual standard error for all the plots. Um, and you just saw me do it. The code was actually a little later on. If you plot that object, you get a residuals versus predicted values plot, which looks reasonably acceptable. You might find a few things to fuss about here, but there's no glaring issue with unequal variances here, except maybe down here. Summary and intervals function do usual nice things. A summary gives you additional information on each coefficient, the estimate, standard error, test of whether that's zero, which doesn't make any sense here, and of course then a p-value for that test. Intervals is more interesting. It gives you walled-based, i.e. normal approximation-based confidence intervals for each one of the parameters. And one can plot predicted values in a variety of different ways, draw lines. I'm going to skip over that code so I can talk about actually fitting um, these lines. That was fitting each curve, each plot separately. If we've got those fits, so SB plot is the result of this NLS list function. If we feed that into the NLME function, we will fit the nonlinear mixed effects model. And if we try that, it thinks for a little bit and then gives us a did not converge error and it tells us to increase the iterations. I'll tell you now, if you increase the iterations, and these are two different things that you can increase, that doesn't help you. Let's look at the output. What you get from fitting a nonlinear mixed effects model, this is the non-summary version, summary adds more information, is the log likelihood, which can be used for a variety of comparisons, Estimates for the fixed parameters. Remember, these are the averages over the three plots. And you then get information about the random effects. And you notice that it has created this list of things. The, this came automatically from the fact I was taking a nonlinear list curve, fitting it into here. I get standard deviations for each of the parameters and a standard deviation for the residuals, so squared variances. And this bit here, oops, this triangular bit here is the correlation between the random effects. What the default model is fitting is just like I had a correlated intercept and slope in my sea turtles, here all four parameters are correlated. And you notice the problem, three of them, have a correlation of positive one, and three of the pairs have a correlation of negative one. Perfectly correlated. That's bad news. The reason these are perfectly correlated is I'm estimating four correlated random effects from three groups of data. That's way too little information to try to be estimating lots of correlation coefficients. 
So let's simplify the model rather than trying to tell it to try harder because it's going to be, it's a structural problem, not a computational problem. So what we could use is that model that says I have four random effects, but they're uncorrelated. Even if they are biologically correlated, I don't have enough data to estimate them, so I'm not even going to try. This is SBNLME2 here. Um, I'm starting here again with the NLS list. I'm just I'm specifically specifying a random effect structure. This diagonal uncorrelated is known as the PD diag in the NLME literature. That fits just fine, runs without any errors, and gives us basically something that looks very, very similar, except now that I get four different standard deviations, I don't get any correlations. And we notice that one of these random effects, the upper, has a large standard deviation. The other three have standard deviations that are very close to zero. NLME will not let a variance go to zero. That's why these are small non-zero values. Even if truth is, they should be zero. That's a computational thing they do. This model can be specified in two ways, and this is one of the most frustrating and complicated things in using NLME. We can either start and fit the model completely new, which is what this does, line 109 does, or we can use the update command, and there's the way um, you would use update, to start with the previous fit and change something about it especially when you've got a complicated model with lots of pieces in it. Update is very, very handy because it allows you to change one piece and leave everything else the same. The frustrating thing I have using the NLME function is that some things don't work if you try to do them directly, but they do work if you try to specify them as an update. I have no idea why that's the case. It's incredibly frustrating. My practice is usually being to write each model as a standalone model so it's very clear what all the pieces are. And MLME works better with updates than with lots of individual models. So, um, as I say, we can extract. We have the usual extractor functions um, that you might be used to from fitting all sorts of regressions. You can extract the fixed effects separately, the random effects separately. These are those U's, the deviations from the fixed effects. You can put the two together using the COEF function. So plot three is predicted to have an upper intercept of 265. These are the sum of the fixed effect plus the random effect. And just to illustrate what's going on with the random effects model, I'm going to compare these coefficients um, to, oh, can I compare them? It's not an especially good way of doing it. Um, compare the mixed effects model estimates to the individual plot specific estimates. If you're familiar with linear mixed effects models, you may have heard of shrinkage. It's what a blup does shrinks things in towards the overall average. You get the same thing here in a mixed effects, nonlinear version of the model. Um, the overall average was 281. And the group here, group one, which has a really high upper bound, if you estimate it from just that data, gets pulled very much in towards, which gets reduced very much. The group that's below the average gets pulled up. That's shrinkage. And that happens with the nonlinear mixed effects model. Does not happen when you fit each plot in its own self. So you can plot the results in a variety of ways. This augmented prediction function takes an NLME, plots the predictions, um, and I will zoom this temporarily so we can see this. We see the data. 
we see two different lines. Level zero is the fixed effect only. That's the blue line. It's the same blue line in each of these plots. The red line, whatever its color this is, is the level one line. It includes the random effects. And you notice that this was plot one where the, the original as plot specific estimate was really high. It's pulled up slightly. Two is about average. Three is pulled down slightly. Um, very easy to get plots of the curve overlaying on the data for each individual cluster just by plotting and then this augpred function. The variances suggest that it's not necessary to include all the random effects. We can restrict the model um, by only saying there's just one random effect. Before we had four, it only looks like there's an upper uh, variability and um, there are a variety of ways of fitting that. One of the things about NLME in general is that it is incredibly difficult to figure out de novo what exactly you need to do to fit a model. Examples are really, really, really helpful. And that's why there are so many different ways in this code for doing the same thing. So one has access to AIC model selection statistics. One could also, if you want to do um, analysis of variance or likelihood ratio tests, those have some issues. Um, AIC is usually what people use to choose things like variance component structures. Um, and I'm looking at the time and I've been talking relatively quickly. Um, I'm skipping over a whole bunch of stuff that does um, two levels of variability. It's a lot harder, uh, especially trying to read the documentation and fit it. And this is a case where updating works and trying to specify a model from the scratch does not. Um, and then about halfway through, I start talking about um, using other software, NLimmer, um, or an Bayesian approach. And in the interest of time, I'm going to stop and deal with questions. Um, and if there's interest, I can start here in a couple of weeks and we can look at sort of code and some of the bells and whistles to get other code to fit. So to back up, the two questions I asked were, what are the, you know, I need three is what I want. Um, LME3 is a model just with a random effect for the upper. It has, it fits essentially as well and has a smaller AIC statistic than the model that had all four random coefficients components because three of them are essentially unnecessary. There's no variability or apparently no variability, at least amongst these three plots in those parameters. So the questions I asked is what's the average curve? And there are the coefficients for the average curve. They're given by the fixed effects line shown there. Is there variability between the plots? Yes. There's, there seems to be a substantial, moderate amount of variability between the upper coefficient, although it's not very big if you just look at these plots here. Um, and if you use AIC, you find out that in fact the model with this uh, variance, the upper variance, is in fact a smaller AIC than the model without it, suggesting that that should be included in the model. So that's a flying tour. Um, these will always work better when it's somebody else doing it on their data, um, but it gives you an idea of the sorts of things you do, why these are computationally rather difficult, and how to specify models, the key, which is not always obvious in the documentation for NLME, is to start with a grouped data variable, which makes lots of things much nicer. And with that, I will stop and entertain any questions. You're welcome to mute. I'll stop sharing my screen. Oh, can I? 
stop sharing. Thank you, Philip. That was awesome. And I think uh, maybe I'm speaking for others, but I'm really excited to see the next part in two weeks. I could listen to this for a while. <laughs> and I love being able to see the comparison between all these different methods. I think that's such a, a great way of trying to figure out what's going on. So I definitely appreciate it. Um, we have some, some time for questions. I just want to say I agree. Thank you so much, Dr. Dixon. This was really, really great. Um, and it was also kind of satisfying to hear you say that fitting these models was difficult because I've spent a lot of time trying to read the MLME documentation. And I agree the grouped data thing was not obvious and it was a struggle to figure that out. So thank you. <laughs> um, this is a great resource, I think, for anyone who wants to just try to start fitting these models. Yeah, go look um, in the Pinheiro and Bates book on NL, linear uh, uh, mixed effects models in general has quite a bit on NLME. I didn't find it answering the questions I was trying to have. Um, and I have struggled more than once trying to specify groups directly uh, rather than creating a group data object. And specifying the groups directly, there is one case where you need to do it, but in general, it just you just get this very unhelpful error message because more than once I've tried to fit something and the error message I get says, I'm not going to do it. That doesn't say it quite that way, but it functionally is, you don't know how to talk to me, go away. <laughs> and that's not very helpful from software, which is why examples are really helpful. Yeah, I have some specific questions, but um, I think I could do um, a session with my data um, and work through some of those questions out loud, I guess, um, for luncheonators. Up to you. I was going to channel you and um... I, mean, I haven't finished writing the code yet, but um, yeah, your data is harder than I, than, than, than I thought to, to analyze well. Yeah, there's a lot of things that barks at you about, I feel like, when I try to do it. Um, okay, yeah, we can talk about that, but I mean, I'm obviously interested in this, so I would love more, <laughs> more sessions about it. But. Yeah, so what I didn't talk about are, well, I, I, what I, We'll skip the the NLMER code because that's just a matter of how do you specify the model. Um, but then talk about the other two approaches: meta analysis and um, Bayesian approach to doing this. Have yeah, you I would really. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. I was just really like to hear about this. Yeah, use the meta analysis approach. I haven't heard of that, and I was wondering if that was something you came up with, or whether that's the strategy people tend to use. Um, well, I didn't come up with it. Um, essentially, until he retired, my um, counterpart at Oregon State published a paper, I want to say five years ago now, on simplicity and complexity in ecological data analysis, which is one of my favorite papers. Um, and he, Paul, that's Paul Murtaugh, he argues very strongly for, you can do all sorts of complicated, fancy, really wild modeling and dig yourself into a very big hole and spend an awful lot of time and backing out to what is the experimental unit? What do I, what can I measure from each experimental unit? And then analyze those can often answer your questions very much more directly in a way you understand. And that's using meta analysis to do that. That's cool. Yeah, I hadn't thought about using it within an experiment. I mean, I think it only thought of it from the classic meta-analysis. Combining observational studies or, or multiple yeah. studies. Yeah. yeah, that's the connection. Meta-analysis combines estimates of something of interest from multiple studies. Well, in, in the example here, each plot then gets treated as one study. There you go. Makes sense. Any questions from anyone else? It makes sense when you, th when you see yeah. it. 
Yeah. It's hard to think about it. Yeah. Uh, hi, Dr. Dixon, can I ask a question? Please. Thank you. So uh, you use upper, lower, mid, and scale, uh, the four parameters in the model. So does this model uh, is specially designed for the curve where it have two platforms at the uh, highest level and the lowest level and in the middle level, it just uh, shows some linear uh, curve. I mean, is this model specifically uh, designed for such kind of uh, thoughts? This is the, um, this, st I, I skipped over, um, I think, Fernando talked about self-starter functions. The markdown document has more information about self-starter functions. Um, yes, this is specific for this decreasing logistic function. Oh, okay. Um, uh, NLRAA. Um, Fernando has a very nice, um, co has taken the self-starter functions, which basically package up a function and extra information like derivatives and good guesses as to starting values. Um, there is a collection of these all start with the capital S, capital S in the base stats package. Um, so these are the ones that are in the base stats. And Fernando has gone and written a variety of agronomically interesting ones. So Ricker population growth, um, some threshold models, linear plateau, quadratic plateau, bilinear um, that get used, especially in agronomic applications. Um, and a list of all of those is in the vignette for um, Fernando's package, the NLRAA. Um, if you actually, Um, question mark, get the help for it. Um, you see that, remember, I had upper, lower, mid, and scale. And the function actually internally defines those slightly differently. Mm -hmm. You also get a, a text version of the equation that is that um, particular model. So if you ever want to see what the model is that I'm fitting, this is basically that two parameter logistic runs between lower and upper rather than between zero and one. Okay. So that choice was made not because somebody said, um, you know, you got to use this. Somebody said, this is a curve that seems to describe what's going on. It seems to be biologically reasonable. Um, all of this has been uh, based on, oops, I'm not sure, thank you, Bob. Um, I turned off my screen share. So I'm here doing things and you can't see anything. Um, share. Um, so th th that choice of curve was basically driven by the shape of the data. Oh yeah. And what I was talking about is um, the vignette for, the, for Fernando's package has oh. two lists of self-starting functions, oh. ACE R, and then all the ones that he has added, including Ricker population growth, um, linear plateau, a variety of threshold models, quadratic plateau. Um, I see, that's very cool. Which make it much easier to fit a model if you've got a self-starting function. You could write the equation. You don't have to use a self-starting function. More things go right more easily with a self-starting function. Yeah. Thank you. Anyone else? All right. So it seems like we will look forward to a couple weeks from now, um, the rest of, uh, or another session on nonlinear fixed effects models. Um, and yeah, this has been awesome. I also would love at some point to hear um, any of your highlights from the statistical ecology conference um, and anyone else who went to it. Um, so I don't know if when that would be, but um, I'd love to hear kind of if there were some 
some particularly relevant hot topics of debate. Um, that would be sure. good. So, cool. Yeah, condensing to uh, one very, very busy and intense week. Um, that's a little hard, but <laughs> um, yeah, I sure. may actually see if I can find the blooper reel. Um, <laughs> They, they put, the, with the permission of the people showing up in it, they assembled a, a list of bloopers. That's awesome. I watched, I watched a little bit, and I really liked the GitHub, or the um, Slack um, format for it. It was a really neat format to have a conference. And I was able to see a few of the things that I don't think I was able to fully engage. Yeah, I wasn't able to fully engage in it. But it was a really cool format for an online conference. Yeah. Well, for those of you that wonder what we're talking about, this was the uh, International Statistical Ecology Conference, which happens usually end of June, early July, every second year. Um, obviously, we weren't going to Sydney, Australia this year, so they did it all virtually. Um, and apart from the fact that one of the sessions was from 3 a.m. until 6 a.m. in the morning, U.S. Central Time, um, there was no th nothing that worked. There were people in there from 21 of the 24 time zones in the world. <laughs> so somebody was going to be inconvenienced. So anyway, yeah, that'll be fun. Okay, well, cool. Well, thanks everyone for showing up and thanks Philip for a wonderful presentation. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Take care. Bye everyone. Bye, everyone.